the millennium, a doctrine already well established among Christians, accepted worldwide as sound doctrine, according to the churches we all grew up in. But just like the rapture has lost its momentum, in spite of all the propaganda, the millennium, which also seems harmless, has reached its course. It is time to expose it as the false doctrine that it is. Apparently, the doctrine of the millennium is not all that important and it doesn't affect the salvation of the saints. But with time, I've come to understand that I was mistaken. It's actually a dangerous doctrine because from one chapter in the end of the Bible, which is interpreted incorrectly, pretty much all the prophecies are altered in order to accommodate it. The millennium, according to the model which they have taught us, produces this timeline. Everything begins at the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. After Jesus ascends, comes the pouring down of the Holy Spirit. Then according to them, comes the day that the Lord comes back in secret, which is the famous rapture. The good Christians are raptured, while the lukewarm Christians stay in the tribulation of seven years. Halfway in the seven years comes the character of the Antichrist and also the mark of the beast. The Armageddon takes place at the end of the tribulation where Satan gathers his army against the Jews and the Christians. And here is when the Lord officially comes back, when every eye sees him. This is the second coming because the previous one was a secret one. And Jesus destroys Satan's army, after which Satan is imprisoned for a thousand years and the judgment of the nation starts. In this judgment, the millennials say that it consists of how well you behaved with the Jews or if you didn't take the mark. Then only the saints resurrect in what they believe to be the first resurrection and the saints that were also raptured before the tribulation also descend so that they may reign for a thousand years. At the end of the 1000 years where Jesus is currently reigning in the state of Israel, in this world where people can still rebel and sin, Satan is released from his prison so that he may again lead an army against the children of God. And again, Jesus comes and destroys them. And this time he casts the devil into the lake of fire. Then all the rest of the dead resurrect for a second judgment. And this judgment determines if they go to the lake of fire or have eternal life in the new world. The world is completely destroyed and a new heaven and earth is formed. And then finally, eternity starts where there is no more rebellion or sin. This confusing timeline is what most Christians believe today. But the true timeline is a bit simpler and more organized. The true millennium begins when Jesus died on the cross. With this act, Satan was disarmed and bound. Then the Holy Spirit was poured down. After a long time, or a thousand symbolic years, Satan is released or loose for a short season in order to deceive everyone and battle against the saints. At the end of this tribulation comes the Lord Jesus and his only return where every eye sees him. His angels will gather his elect, and this is a true rapture, which is not in secret. And he sends down fire and burns everyone and everything. The devil is cast into the lake of fire, and all the dead are resurrected. Then the one and only judgment begins, in order to judge the good and the bad, to give to everyone according to their works. And whoever is found written in the book of life descends onto a new heaven and new earth, which will be formed from the ashes, while the rest are cast into the lake of fire, and eternity begins. There is only one correct version. The correct one is the one they don't teach you, the one that is not convenient to them, the one that the enemy of God prefers that you don't know. In order to understand the difference between the millennium in these two timelines, we have to figure out the initiation and the duration of the millennium. Now, what initiates the millennium? Let's go to chapter 20 of Revelation. In Revelation 20, starting from verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. What initiates the millennium is when Satan is bound. We can all agree on that. So then the question is, when exactly is Satan bound? The dispensationalists, or as I like to call them, the millennials, we'll call them that in this teaching, they believe that because this is chapter 20, that that means that, it's, that the events in chapter 20 must take place after 19, just because that's the order as written. And that is not necessarily true because this book, the book of Revelation, is not in chronological order. The Apostle John documented what he saw, but it wasn't necessarily in chronological order. They believe that Satan was bound after the tribulation 
and Armageddon because it's simply written afterwards. So when was Satan truly bound? Well, first of all, binding and loosing. What does that mean? Revelation 9 verse 14, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet loose or, or release the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and for a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men or a third of mankind. To lose in the context of revelation means to release so they may complete their function, which in the case of these four angels is to kill a third part of humans. And the opposite of that is to bind, which means to retain them so that they may not complete their, their primary function of killing them. That's their purpose of killing mankind. And the primary function of Satan it's not necessarily to kill people, but it's first and foremost to deceive all of humanity and to kill the saints. So when does this phenomenon occur of binding and retaining Satan so that he doesn't complete his primary function of deceiving everyone and killing the saints? Well, according to scripture, there is only one moment that this occurs, and this occurred on the cross. There is really no evidence in the Bible of another event that transcended heaven and earth with which legally retained Satan so that he may not complete his purpose. What happened on the cross besides the perfect sacrifice for our sins? Let's go to Colossians 2.13 and I'm going to be reading from King James and the New King James Version. They're practically the same thing. Sometimes it's easier to understand on New King James, but when you're going to get to the to the nitty gritty in the book of Revelation, I recommend, I recommend King James. All right, so Colossians 2, 13 says, And you being dead in your trespasses and this uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he had taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And then let's go to Hebrews. And then Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says, For much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and delivered them and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So when Christ died, he disarmed the devil and was triumphant over him on the cross. By disarming the devil, he took away his weapons. By taking away his weapons, he took away his power and dominion. And by taking away his power and dominion, he retained him so that he may not complete his primary function of deceiving everyone and causing everyone to gather together to destroy the saints. Now let's continue. What else does Revelation 20 say about the initiation of the millennium? In Revelation 20, it talks about an angel who came down that had the key to the bottomless pit. So who is the angel with the key to the bottomless pit? Let's go to answer that. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18 says, I am I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Revelation 3, 7 says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things, says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man opens. And we know that Lord Jesus Christ is not an angel. But clearly, he's the one that has the key of David. Is he that has the key of life? He's the one that has the key of death. And that means that he also has the key to the bottomless pit. It's all the same thing. Only Jesus has the key of life and death. He took this power from Satan and won on the cross, had victory on the cross. With this act, Satan was bound and retained. This is the only moment in the timeline of humanity with many testimonies in Scripture in which the devil has been disarmed with a powerful act. And that act was Jesus Christ crucified. 
So when exactly was Satan bound according to scripture? There is only one moment in the real timeline. He was bound when Jesus died on the cross. Now that we know when the millennium was initiated, what is the duration of the millennium? Is it literally a thousand years? Well, I want you to focus on the language of the Bible in the book of Revelation when it speaks about times and duration. Revelation 2.10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Revelation 11, 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three coarse days. Revelation 11, verse 11 says, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up in their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Revelation 12, 14 says, And to the woman were given two wings of the great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, a times, and half a time. Revelation 13, 5 says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And this is also mentioned in Daniel, the book of Daniel, really quick, um, chapter 7. Daniel 7, 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand, until the times, until a time and times and the dividing of time. All these verses, including the confirmation of the book of Daniel, is talking about the same thing. They're talking about the duration of the tribulation, the one and only tribulation. Um, that gave you seven testimonies, which are different variations, but they're expressing the same thing. They're expressing a short time in which the devil will be deceiving everyone and will be granted legal and supranational power to persecute the saints. And the Apostle Paul was shown the same message many times, just like with Joseph in Egypt when he interpreted the Pharaoh's dream about the seven plentiful years and the seven years of famine. There were two different dreams, but they were in fact the same event, one event. So there is no different. I'm giving you seven testimonies of the same event in tribulation. This is the tribulation that's talking about. And let me tell you, from these seven testimonies, we can conclude that it is unknown the duration of the tribulation exactly. Only that it is a short time so that the, the devil is not able to completely uh, do everything that he, he wants to do. He can't deceive the saints because it's going to be a very difficult trial for the people of God, like none before. Now, with this evidence that I'm showing you, that the times and durations in the book of Revelation is by no means literal, do you really think that in just one chapter, chapter 20 of Revelation, where it mentions a thousand years, that this duration is not going to follow that same pattern, that a thousand years was going to be deviating from the rest of the established guide in this book. I think we can all agree, if we are to use the same language as the book of Revelation, that it is not literally a thousand years, just like the tribulation will not literally be three and a half days. Instead, it's referring to a long period of time versus a short period of time. That's it. So the millennium is a long period of time, while the tribulation is a short period of time. That's the correct way to interpret a thousand years in the book of Revelation chapter 20. I truly hope that we all are using logic and common sense here, and that we're also being guided by the Holy Spirit. And when it comes from, when something comes from God, you, you know and you feel that confirmation in your heart that, that what is being given to you is from Him. Because I do believe that it's time to begin setting ourselves free from some false doctrines such as this that we've been taught since we were children and it's never been questioned. And at the end of the video, I will be providing the reason why they have done this, why they have deceived us with this doctrine and why it is actually very dangerous. Now let's continue reading this famous chapter, chapter 20. Revelation 20. Verse 3 says, 
and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. And he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he, he must be loose for a little season. So what is going to happen when Satan is loose for a little season or a short while? We already read it. It's all over the book of Revelation and, and all over the prophets. Um, I gave you seven examples of just that. And even the Lord Jesus Christ said it, that it will be a tribulation like never before and, and will ever be. It's a short time because he himself said that if those days were not shortened, that no one will be saved. Now, there is a parallel to this in, um, in chapter 12 of Revelation. Revelation 12, 7 says, And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. This is talking about the same thing. The devil is given a short amount of time to deceive the whole world and wage war against the saints or surround the holy city, which means the same thing. It's wherever the saints are gathered. The holy city surrounded in Revelation is when, wherever the saints are gathered in the world because we're speaking in spiritual terms here, not uh, earthly terms. So it's not a geo geographical location. Knowing this will greatly help you understand the book of Revelation, what I just told you. We have already established without a shadow of a doubt that when Satan is loosed or released, that that's when the tribulation starts because he's no longer being restrained. He cannot complete his primary function and he will do it with great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. Let's continue. Remember that this is not chronological order and that the apostle is documented uh, as he's seeing and receiving the visions and interpreting, okay? Revelation 20, verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which, has not, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon his forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurre resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now these are the famous verses that have been used to practically change the entire Bible and make up a lot of doctrines. Uh, just using these verses that I just read. Now, in other words... If what the Lord Jesus Christ said when he was speaking to his disciple contradicts this vision, which is difficult to understand and practically is another version of telling the same events in Revelation, well, forget it. What the Lord said in simple earthly terms will always come secondary and must adjust to this vision according to them, one way or another. That's how it works for them. First of all, what we have already established with the scriptures cannot be broken. The millennium is a long period of time that begins when Christ died at the cross. That means that these verses cannot be interpreted as if it was meant for after the tribulation, because clearly the act of releasing Satan puts an end to the millennium, and this is what activates the tribulation. What is the first resurrection? Well, these millennials, they claim that the first resurrection are the saints who resurrected in their physical bodies after the tribulation, so they can reign for a thousand years after Satan is bound. But you see how this automatically contradicts everything, all the truths that we have already established. What is truly the first resurrection according to Jesus Christ? John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death to life verily verily i say unto you the hour is coming and now 
is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Now, if you have life after being dead, is that not the very definition of resurrecting? Uh, John 11, 25 says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Colossians 2, 12 Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who had raised him from the dead. And then Colossians 3, 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. There are even more verses to confirm this, but the first resurrection, according to the sound words of the Lord himself, is when you are born again. When our previous self, the man of sin, dies and we are resurrected with Christ, that's the first resurrection. That's why the Lord Jesus says that he who believes in me has passed from death to life and will not be condemned. Because we all know that condemnation is the second death and it, then that's eternal. So whoever does not come into condemnation is because they believe in Jesus Christ and they will not suffer the second death because they are born of God and have experienced the first resurrection, which is a spiritual res resurrection. It's not, it's not a physical one. There is no Bible verse to refute this. There are only very wild imaginations from men, uh, cunning words from ministers of the devil who have made up false doctrines, which is not written. So then what does Revelation 20 verse 6 refer to when it says, Blessed is he that takes part in the first resurrection because the second death has no power over them. That refers to uh, the same thing. It's talking about nothing outside of what Jesus said. If the first resurrection is when we are born again in this life, then when is the second resurrection? Because if there's a first one, then there has to be a second one, right? Let's go back to John, the book of John uh, chapter 11. Starting from verse 21 says, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the la at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives Whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. The last day in all the scripture refers to the time frame after the end of the world, after the day of the Lord, when everyone is resurrected and judged before eternity begins. And those that are, are in Christ will resurrect to eternal life. And those that are condemned will resurrect to eternal death of damnation. Martha knew this, but there is a clear distinction still between what Martha was referring to and what Jesus was referring to. The resurrection of the last day that she was mentioning is the second resurrection. And the difference between the second resurrection and the first is that the second is a physical resurrection in an immortal body, while the first resurrection is spiritual. Now let's establish another truth. Who are those that were given authority to judge? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. I think that we can all agree that those that are given authority to judge, to reign, to be priests are the elect, the people of God. So then the question should be, when does someone become a priest of God? After the tribulation, like the millennials say, or before? Let's see. Revelation 1 verse 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loves us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and had made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Go to First Peter Chapter 2, verse 9 says, But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a particular people, 
that ye should shew forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ephesians 2.5 says, Even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. When we are resurrected, um, in other words, when we are born again, we are seated spiritually in heavenly places, and we already have the faculty to judge with righteous judgment even now. Now let's go to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, starting from verse 19, says, And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarish, to Paul, to Lud, that draw the bow, to Tubal and Javal, Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. So let's talk about sharing the gospel, evangelizing. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all the nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and in, upon mules, upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem, said the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. So when does this occur that he will take them from the Gentiles to be priests and, and of what kingdom? The, the kingdom of the future millennium? What is it talking about here? Isaiah 35, starting from verse 4, says, Say to them that are fearful of heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall, shall waters break out and streams in the desert, and the patched ground shall, be, shall become pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass which re, with reeds and rushes. And an ho, a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go upon thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. So talking about when the Lord was born and it's talking about when the Lord started performing miracles. It's talking about when Jesus came. All this, that the salvation has come. And let's continue to verse uh, chapter 32. And starting from verse 15, says, Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be f be a fruitful field and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. It's, it's similar speech here of what happens when the Lord came. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruit, fruitful field and the work of the righteousness shall be peace and the effort of the righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceful habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places when it shall hail coming down on the forest and the city shall be low in a low place. Blessed are ye that sow besides all the waters that sent forth thither the feet of the ox and of the ass. And just to wrap up these uh, prophecies, talking about when the Lord came, what happened, and uh, what He did, the miracles, and the salvation that came to the world. And then finally, it's talking about pouring down Spirit. So let's... Let's get to that, to that uh, prophecy. That is in Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 24. It says, For I will take from you, from among the heathen, and gather you out of the countries, and will bring you into your own land. And this is when people think that that's when Israel, the state of Israel was born. But let's see really when, when this was talking about. It's in the same, um, in the same uh, passage here. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. It's talking about when 
uh, God forgives um, his people. A new heart also I will give you, a new spirit I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I, will, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in, in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. This moment refers to the day of Pentecost, and when one is born again with a new heart and receives the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about anything else. So, it is here when God forgives us, washes us, and from here forth, we are His holy nation, and He is our God. And from here, we are kings and priests. Now, why are we kings and priests since now, if we don't even have a physical kingdom that we can see with our own eyes? Well, it's the same reason why he says that to not let anyone take your crown because we already have a crown. We already have authority to fight and have victory over principalities, over powers, and to cast out demons because the King of Kings has already given us authority when he poured out his spirit unto us. And we pass from death to life. The kingdom of God is spiritually within you. And how are we already priests then? Well, because the word of God says that you have to confess your sins to one another, talking about the people of God. And as far as I know, you only confess your sins to a priest because God already took us from the Gentiles and made us into priests and Levites in order to listen to confession of sins, to diagnose what's the problem, what's the issue, in order to intercede for the sinner to minister to them and to guide them to their Redeemer so they may give fruits of repentance and to present them as a perfect man without blemish or wrinkles unto God. So don't you do this type of work? I do. I got a person in need to reconcile with God and that he remains in that state until the end. So God already made us kings and priests. God already came and forgave us. God already re resurrected us. And we already um, have experienced that first resurrection. And we are already seated with him in heavenly places. All right, so let's continue in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse 7, says, And when, when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, and the number of whom is at the, as the sand of the sea. Now, I want you to underline, gather them together to battle. And let's go back to chapter 19, verse 19. This is when the Lord comes on his white horse with his angels. And in verse 19, in chapter 19 says, And I saw a beast, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. So underline two and connect it to chapter 20, verse 8. It's talking about the same thing, same event, just and in a different vision that was received. Okay, and let's continue chapter 20, um, verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. The camp of the saints, we already established, that's where the God's people are gathered any place in the world, because it's spiritual. Um, it compassed the camp of the saints uh, about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So again, underline, fire came down from God and out of heaven and devoured them. And let's connect that to the previous chapter, last verse, verse 21 says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So fowls or birds means angels who destroyed all the enemies of God. It's talking about the same thing. So where it says the rest were slain out of the word that proceeded out of his mouth, uh, you can underline that and connect that to verse 9 where it says the fire came down from God out of heaven in verse 20, in chapter 20. Same thing. 19, uh, those verses in chapter 19 is the same as uh, these verses in chapter 20, verse 8 and 9. It's the same thing being told in a different way. Um, if you can understand that, it's just, it's simple. It's talking about the same thing. A lot of times the book of Revelation repeats itself in different visions. So if you don't understand that, you're going to get very confused and you're going to make a very extensive timeline like most theologians out there, doctors and people who teach the uh, book of Revelation, they make a huge timeline, but they don't understand that a lot of times it's just talking about the same thing. 
It's just in a, di a different vision of the same event. All right, uh, continuing chapter 20, verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. We can see clearly that the events that took place in Revelation chapter, eight, uh, chapter 20, verse 8, is exactly the same event as Jesus coming down on the white horse in Revelation 19. They are two different visions, but clearly the same event. Jesus is only coming back one time, folks, and he sends fire down one time to consume his enemies. Not two times, one time. And the devil is also going to be released only one time to deceive the entire world, not twice. That's ridiculous, okay? So there's no evidence in the entire Bible that says that these things will happen twice. Zero evidence. It's all made up here, um, incorrectly interpreting chapter 20 of Revelation. So what exactly happens the next time the Lord comes? Well, um, first of all, it won't be in secret. And when he comes back, the world ends and is burned. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, or not precede those that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a loud voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So let's talk about a, a loud voice, a loud shout, like a trump, like a trumpet. And let's see um, a parallel to that in Second Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 10, says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Does that mean that nobody will know, nobody will hear it, it's going to be a secret? No, like, it's you, meaning that you don't know when he's coming, but it's, it's not going to be in secret. Why? Because it says right here, in which, on that day, the heavens shall pass away with great noise. Does that sound like a secret rapture to you? No. Uh, and that's like about the day, the next time uh, the Lord comes. Um, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with, with fervent heat, and the earth also the words that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Peter is talking about the church in this generation, about when the Lord comes back. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about this generation. While we can still repent, while people can still depart from God, and speaking to this generation, he says that the day of the Lord will come as a, uh, with great noise. So it's going to be very loud, okay? Where the heavens are literally going to break open. And at that time, according to the words of the Lord Jesus, when he comes back, every eye will see him, and they will lament, knowing that he's real and the end has come. So Peter writes that the return of the Lord the result of that is that the elements that exist today in this earth are going to melt with fervent heat and will also be completely destroyed. So everything will melt and no one will be left alive, obviously. So this is not talking about a future millennial reign. This is talking about this generation, what this generation is to expect when the Lord comes back. Not after a whole, another thousand years and all this. All this. No, it's talking about this generation. This is the same thing mentioned in chapter 19 and also in chapter 20 when the Lord comes and from his mouth proceeds fire and a sword and burns everyone. It's the same event. So now the millennials have to explain to me how is it that when the Lord comes back and everything is burned and melted, how is it that supposedly the current state of Israel where the capital helms the pride flag, how is it that the Lord will reign there when it's clear that when the Lord comes back, as a thief in the night, everything's going to be burned in a sea of fire. It doesn't make any sense. So then what happens when the Lord comes back uh, once more? The day he comes back, uh, which the, the prophet spoke about and even the Lord himself spoke about. Well, the world ends. And then here is finally when the judgment begins. The, fun, the judgment arrives, which is also only, only just one, one judgment day. So let's continue in the book of Revelation. Chapter 11, chapter 11 talks about 
the great white throne or um, the, the great judgment day when the books are open. And when it speaks about the judgment, the millennials say that there are actually two judgments. They say that there's judgment of the, of the nation or the trial of the nations and the white throne judgment. So they say there's two and, and there's some even smarter who say there's actually three, that there is uh, the judgment of Christ before these two. So I'm not going to focus on that third uh, group of people. I'm going to focus on the, what the millennials say. And they say there's two judgments and they claim that the people who will be accepted into the millennium, um, this future millennium that they claim, have to match one of these four prerequisites. The first prerequisite is a group, um, is the Jews, actually. The first prerequisite is, is all the Jews. The second group are those who have helped the Jews. In, order, in other words, they're pro-Israel. The third group are those that did not uh, take the mark of the beast during the tribulation. And the fourth group are those who did take the mark, but at the last, uh, as a last resort, last effort to get in, they have to cut off their hand, um, literally, in order to get into the millennium. This is what well-known scholars and doctors and theologians with millions of followers um, believe and teach. In other words, millions of people are in agreement with what I just mentioned here about these four groups. So obviously with the real timeline that I just showed you, there's no room for these foolish four groups of people because this is tied with the reason why they promote this false doctrine so much. And I have to entertain this for a moment because I have to explain it now, why they do this, why they're pushing this so much, what's the purpose, the reason behind it. So first of all, according to them, the first group of people that will be accepted um, to enter into the millennium in the trial of the nations are the Jews and not and no, it doesn't matter if they're born again or not. So if they believe in God and the Son of God or not, it doesn't matter. The only prerequisite for them is that they're just Jews and automatically they enter. Um, but do you know what Jesus said to the Jews? That they did not know their time of visitation. That the kingdom of God will be taken from them and given to those who will bear fruit. That the punishment for Sodom and Gomorrah will be more tol tolerable than theirs and that whoever doesn't believe in Christ is already condemned. And whoever means also the Jews, just whoever, Jews also. So again, with this doctrine, the millennials indicate that simply for being a Jew by blood, that they will enter in that future millennium. And to add insult, they didn't even have to believe in Jesus Christ, pretty much. Because now they physically see him um, in his glory reigning and they have to believe by force and that's how they are ultimately saved um, being in the millennium practically because they just forcefully have to worship him and they, they can see him so they don't need to believe or have faith because they can see that he's there right, with glory of God. Faith is believing in something you can't see with your eyes. But when Jesus Christ is literally sitting on his throne on the earth, you can see him. There's no faith in the Millennial Kingdom. You're looking at Jesus and you see Him. We don't see Him today. That's why we have faith. Because we can't see Him. We believe in Him. But in the Millennial Kingdom, everybody on the earth will see Him and they'll go see Him once a year. Where's the faith? I don't see any faith in the Millennium. I see God telling these people in their natural bodies, you do this, you do this, you do this, or else. And that's all throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this millennial kingdom in which Jesus set up. It's all the world, they will see Jesus in his coming of glory. That's what Matthew 25 said, right? When he comes in his glory, they're obviously going to see him. Thus, no faith is necessary for salvation. Why is that? Because faith is something that is not seen. But see, they're going to see Jesus. That's why faith is not necessary in the millennium. So this contradicts everything that the Lord Jesus Christ taught. Pretty, pretty much everything, this doctrine. Now, they say that the second group that has a pass into the millennium are the sympathizers of the state of Israel. And they promote it using this verse. Matthew uh, 25 verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes into his glory and all the holy angels with him, 
Then he will sit on his throne of glory, and the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, and put the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clawed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see a st uh, you stranger and, tug and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer him and say to them, As surely I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So what they believe is, since the Lord Jesus mentions the word brethren during the judgment, uh, and the least of these, that automatically he's referring to the Jews today in the state of Israel. So when Jesus comes and sits down on his throne, he's going to take the goat nations, all the nations that were against the Jews, most likely Muslim nations, because the United Nations will be made up of Muslims, and Muslims hate the Jews, and that's what they're doing at the end of the tribulation, going to try to kill and destroy the Jews. And God will take all those goat nations and say, that's it, go straight to hell. And God will take all these other nations that have supported and been in, in the sight of the Jews and say, now you too can come into the millennium. And so some nations will make it through that are not in Israel. And the sheep nations will be kept and the goat nations will be put right into hell. And so that's why it's so important to always be on the side of the nation of Israel. That's God's chosen people. Help a Jew. Hug a Jew. <laughs> So this judgment is called judgment of nations. Judgment of nations. That's what it's called. So again, this is judging different nationalities around the world. And then he's going to spare or damn them depending on how well they treated the Jews. So that's the determination of the judgment at this judgment of nations. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. So you see that? This is after his second coming. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? Uh, so these people who are able to enter, who are spared at the judgment, Jesus told them, because you fed me, you clothed me, you visited me in prison. Now think about that, visiting you in prison. And Jesus said, because you did this to me, you're able to be spared. And then these people are asking him, so when did we do this to you, Jesus? I don't remember doing that. And Jesus answers at verse 40, and the king shall answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, in as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my what? Brethren. Brethren, you have done it unto me. So notice right here that the determination is how they treated his brethren. Now, who are his brethren? If you look at every time the Bible says the word bread, uh, not the Bible, the book of Matthew, what the author is thinking, Matthew, when he says brethren, it's referring to Jews. Are you already getting a glimpse of why they promote this false doctrine so much? So there are two questions I have to ask then. Who are the least of these and who are his brethren that he's talking about in the correct context? Who are these people? Who are they? Well, let's look for the answer. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Chapter 12 verse 50 says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And then Matthew 10 verse 40 says, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Verse 42, And whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of the disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So here the Lord is not talking about the Jews. God is talking about anyone who does the will of God is his brother. And anyone who helps a disciple of God, gives him cold water, is the least of these. And uh, they will have a, a reward for helping for aiding disciples of Jesus Christ, the people of God in general. It's not talking about the state of Israel, uh, Jews. Clearly, it's talking about who does the will of God and who is evangelizing um, as a disciple who's doing that work. Those are the people who God is referring to here. Now, 
they say, moving on, they say that the third group will enter if they didn't receive the mark of the beast. Well, I have nothing to say about that, but uh, the fourth group, that's a little bit more pro problematic. Um, some millennials claim that if someone received the mark in their right hand, that in order to enter the millennium, that they have to cut off the right hand. So, um, yeah, they use this verse to justify it. Uh, Matthew, ch Matthew chapter 5. So 5 verse 30 says, And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you for you that one of your members perish, that for your whole body be cast into hell. What if they did take the mark? And that the entrance into the kingdom for them would be the cutting of the right hand where the mark is. Because there were some passages where Jesus says if the right hand offended, he cut it off. So what if in the millennium there's a whole bunch of people with one hand? And that shows that they had taken the mark, but they chose Jesus by cutting off their hand. Like God said, if your right hand offend thee, cut it off. He wasn't just pulling that out of left field. So in a pathetic excuse to force this, doc this false doctrine even more, they say that you can cut off your hand in, in case you, were, you received the mark. When we all know that this passage is referring to sin, to sin here and now in, in this life, and nothing to do with the mark of the beast or the tribulation. Um, and a side note, they also say that those who receive the mark on their forehead, well, uh, they cannot remove it to enter the, the millennium unless they cut off their head. So obviously that means for them that they have to forfeit their lives and be decapitated. So at least they may enter eternal life in the end. What does the Bible say about the mark of the beast in general? That's found in Revelation chapter 14. What happens to those that receive the mark? And 14 verse 9 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So in no place here does it say or mention that you can cut off your hand or, or cut off your head and be saved. This is a poor excuse to raise up a weak and cowardly generation that are being driven into lukewarmness with the message that you can always be safe later, you can always repent later time, uh, that there's a back door just in case. So what can we conclude from the Millennium Doctrine with using these four groups, which is actually being taught today to millions of people? We can conclude that this doctrine is not grounded on the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, but on Zionism. So whatever happens, um, the Jews must all be prioritized and saved. But do you know what the Word of God says about those that call themselves Jews in the last days? Many can get offended by saying this, but the book of Revelation has actually nothing to do with the current state of Israel. Not one thing. If you can receive that and then you go back and read the book of Revelation, I guarantee it that a veil will be taken from your eyes and you will be able to understand and see that it's a lot more simple than you think. We can also conclude that just like the rapture doctrine, the millennium produces lukewarmness. Because if you aren't raptured, then it's okay because you have another chance during the tribulation to prove yourself and to repent and get right with God. Um, and even then, even if you don't repent, well, at least you were nice to the Jews. So you were pro-Israel, so that automatically gives you a free pass to get in. Even if you didn't repent, you weren't born again, uh, it's okay. You get an, There's another opportunity down the road just if you were nice to the Jews. And even if you receive the mark of the beast, which automatically is supposed to condemn you, well, there's always a drastic last option of chopping off your hand um, for the sake of your eternal soul. So all I see here is Zionism and lukewarmness. That's all I see here. That is what is, uh, the dispensational doctrine produces in people, that there is always another chance to repent and stop your sinful life, lifestyle down the road. Deep down, this is what this doctrine sows in, in the people of God, which I used to think that it was harmless. I really did. Up until a little while ago, I thought it was harmless. But I can assure you that this comes from the pit of hell, and it's time to stand firm and no longer tolerate this false doctrine. Let's finally finish the uh, chapter 20 of Revelation. Uh, we were at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven flew, fled away, and there was no place found for them. Why? Because the world was destroyed already.
And I saw that that small and great stand before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And, and the dead were, were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up their dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And whoever was, was not found and written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So when we see here, when it's talking about the dead, it's the same thing as uh, verse 5, where it says, but the rest of the dead did not live again. Until that was, it's, all talking, it's talking about the same thing. So the rest of the dead are those who were not born again while they had a chance to repent, while they were still alive. The other dead are those who were not washed of their sins, uh, those who were not sealed with the Holy Spirit and clothed in the royal priesthood, and a holy nation because like Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no second chance. There is no back door. He is the door, the only door. Because blessed and holy is he who takes part in the first resurrection and the new birth. He who has washed his garments with the blood of the lamb and is faithful until the end. If I had to give a piece of advice to all those doctors and theologians from a humble servant of the Lord, it is not to teach from the book of Revelation if you haven't even understood the sound words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he was walking the earth, when he spoke of his return and the end of the world. You see, I could practically have given this teaching in five minutes just by reading Matthew 24. If you don't understand the earthly things, how dare you teach the heavenly things? So start over. And make sure you accommodate everything to the words of the Lord Jesus when he spoke to his disciples. And don't accommodate it to Zionism. Don't accommodate it to dispensationalism. Don't accommodate it to being lukewarm or, or having a second chance or a third chance of salvation later. Salvation was already given. The price was already paid once. So there is no more opportunities. This life is the only opportunity that you have. And it's all about rejecting the world. It's about forsaking sin. It's about repenting. It's about converting and receiving the promise of God, which is his, his, his adoption, is his spirit, so that the second death has no dominion over you. And if you have, in fact, already taken part in the first resurrection, you've been born again, then you are a king. You are a priest. You have your spotless garments. Now, all you have to do is retain that until the end because you can lose it. Yes, you can lose it. Your name can be blotted out from the book of life. So don't let anyone take your crown and not let this world put spots on your garments. So what is the millennium? It's a long period of time that began when the lamb was slain and Satan was bound. A period of time when God is saving his people patiently, waiting for them to repent. We are in the millennium.